Okay, people. Here's the 16th of February edition of uh, Transport in the Time of COVID-19. Um, okay, so yeah, do contact me as a lot of you are. Uh, please try not to leave it to the last minute because it then gets left over to next week. Okay, so the general theme this week is it's all political. Things which you don't think are political are political. And Snackdown. I hope everybody knows what Snackdown is. It's a thing that happens when it's snowing and you look at where the motor vehicles have been. So that shows you how much space is taken up by motor vehicles and what we could do with the rest of it here and here and here. Also, this is uh, from a few years ago from Last Not Lost, a reverse snack down showing what we don't want to see. And this is a lovely shot of one of the already existing low traffic neighborhoods, the De Beaver Estate uh, around Hackney, Islington borders. And that's showing what we want to see. Remember, the clearance of snow and ice is political. This is from Medway Highways. Uh, we have received a lot of requests to salt the footways, but it's impractical, financially draining, so the priority is the carriageway. Uh, nice article on that by Durante Highwayman in 2018. And this is from Richard Lewis saying that perhaps every disabled person in the authority who is unable to drive may now be able to claim compensation under Section 20 of the Toyota Equality Act. Uh, and also uh, subsect uh, sections 109 to 110, section 149, subsection 3. I hope you all knew that, you uh, disabilities rights people. Um, uh, Caroline uh, Criado Perez has uh, done something about uh, how it's gender related as well in her book on how things are measured. Uh, the main political difference, as I said, is about pedestrians and cyclists not being favoured in this country, whereas users of motor vehicles are. Here's something from uh, Surrey as well. Yes, same thing. Uh, note the way they say, uh, when snow falls, our main priority is to salt the road network in blue bold in case you're stupid and which pavements will be cleared pavements will be cleared in order of priority and only after the roads have been cleared in case you're stupid um and they're also saying that pavements and other footways are often cleared from snow without specific treatment by the time the roads have been salted so shut up about it you lot um Right, this is a bit, I was going to file this under your victim blaming for tonight. Um, from the Met Office, they said, weather warnings have been updated and take extra care when driving or walking. Consider not cycling because you may fall off. How about the consider not driving thing, I said, because you know it's the kind of thing I like going on about. Um, just because you may hurt yourself, uh, isn't as important as hurting other people, which you can do if you are not in control of your vehicle uh, when you're driving a motor vehicle on snow and ice. And so we had a bit of a go on about this on Twitter and someone pointed out the Met Office had actually been uh, saying uh, that there should be some restrictions on driving, stick to the main roads, only travel if really necessary, etc. Uh, just to give the full picture. Uh, here's something about winter not being a good argument against cycling. Um, so, for example, here you've got London with a big drop off in cycling when it gets very cold but not in Copenhagen, because Copenhagen caters for cyclists. I went into a bit more detail and figures uh, about the lack of decline in cycling on uh, existing cycle lanes. 
So it gets a bit complicated, but basically put in bicycle lanes and people will carry on using them even when it's um, very cold, particularly if they're cleared properly. Okay, that's your political stuff about snow and icy conditions. Right, now it's back to the Minister, Secretary of State for Transport, Grant Shapps, who I pointed out last week gave this figure, 50% of all journeys in towns to be cycled or walked by 2030, which is not far away. Um, and uh, here's uh, the picture of him with Pete Butty Giggs, uh, uh, radical transport, relatively radical transport book in the background and things he, some questions I raised uh, last week. Uh, the reason I'm referring to the minister is because of this, which is one of the biggest things, uh, probably the main uh, item of news and could be the most important thing to do with transport this year. That's to say the big roads plan being uh, in doubt uh, because it was revealed that Grant Shapps overrode official advice. Um, and uh, this is from The Guardian, and it's about the action taken by Transport Action Network. Uh, and it says, I'll just read it out in full, the claimants have been presented on the one hand with official reasoning in support of a review of the road building program, and on the other hand, with a decision by the defendant not to review the NPS with no explanation of why or on the basis of what information or considerations he chose to depart from his official's advice. Uh, and a, a Department for Transport spokesperson said, the advice to the Transport Secretary set up the criteria for review of the NPS had not been fully met. So there were... Uh, grounds for saying that there should be a review, but not the uh, full meeting of criteria. Uh, anyway, this is something we have to keep an eye on, see what happens, and see if in terms of what bodies like uh, uh, the Committee on Climate Change say, we will get a thorough review of the £27 billion road building network, which is tremendously important, overhangs everything. Uh, okay, now on to air quality. I mentioned this last week, the research from Imperial College, uh, still 3,600 to 4,100 uh, deaths from uh, poor quality, from pollutants, nitrous oxides and small, very small particles. Um, that's the thing you should look at. Uh, there's also uh, this point about fossil fuels causing 8.7 mil million deaths globally. And new for this week, uh, the original paper is here. Do have a look at that. Right, now some more. This is uh, from the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee. Uh, and our new air quality report calls for the government to set tougher targets to lower air pollution, set a target to reduce air pollution's impact on health, encourage public transport use, raise investment in cycling and walking. And there are your links there. You've also got uh, this article from British Lung Foundation. And I um, mentioned a webinar previously, which Dr. Gary Fuller uh, was on. Um, you can see his stuff on recommending uh, active travel solutions on that YouTube link. Uh, that's from a webinar put on by Haringey Clean Air. Okay, air quality. So we're on to LTNs and wild LTN analogy of the week. Yes, we're all like the Khmer Rouge. The Khmer Rouge wanted to get rid of cars and there's a, a Cambodian riding past a load of dumped cars. So um, that's fun cycling campaign. Sarah Berry, Simon Still, Simon Monk are the modern age Khmer Rouge. Don't forget they killed literally millions of their own people. And Simon calling for a little bit of perspective and saying rather nicely, 
if you spend your time comparing a few planters, bollards and cameras to the Berlin Wall or those who are making your driven journeys mildly less convenient to mass murderers, maybe, just maybe, you're the one in the wrong. So that was very nice and uh, politely put by Simon. Uh, still on LTNs and what people say and think about them. Uh, oh God, the times again, relentlessly coming up with nonsense and it isn't balanced by the occasional good article or editorial. It's rebutted, rebutted very well on the thread by Chris Kenyon saying it's really poor journalism. It, the article alleges that LTNs push traffic onto the roads where the poorer people live and it's all for done for rich people. And this is actually a bollocks argument. And do look at Chris's thread. Um, it, it sort of refers to just the kind of nonsense that people come up with and uh, why it's wrong. Here's some backlash. Uh, nice uh, uh, from a body calling it, uh, saying it wants to stop spaces for people schemes. It's not actually a winner as a slogan because most people do think of themselves as people. Um, anyway, that's going on. And yes, uh, one of the things which is constantly used uh, by anti-LTN people is that they slow down emergency vehicles. So what Cycling UK did, and it's the reason why you should be a member of Cycling UK, is they submitted for, uh, freedom of information requests to NHS ambulance trusts in Britain. And uh, if you go to that link, you'll see uh, what they said. Also, Laura Laker in The Guardian did a good report on that. So that's another bit of debunking for you to put in the files when people start complaining about LTNs. Uh, okay, so now on stuff to read and do, still got the police and crime commissioner elections. Interesting to see uh, a conservative candidate, I think in Kent, coming out in support of um, how uh, the people he wanted to represent are against speeding. Uh, so, you know, this could be something to work for with people of all uh, political persuasions. Uh, I mentioned this last week uh, on uh, net zero and absolute zero, a good 20 minutes of your time to be spent looking at that on YouTube. This is new climate action could save millions of lives through clean air diet and exercise. Uh, and I mentioned this before by a good article by Carlton Reed on the cycle industry, uh, which is worth having a look at. Right, uh, this is a most must read, both the review by me and the book by Peter Walker, The Miracle Pill. And I'm not going to tell you what it's about, apart from the fact you have to read it and my review. Um, Transport Action Network who I mentioned before have got to be supported. So go to this site and give them some money because they have to keep on pressing uh, to get the roads building program cut back or canceled. Uh, a new article, a uh, motoring petrol head fanatic saying uh, that actually if fuel duty goes up, it is something that motorists can easily accommodate, which by my reckoning means we have to rack up the price of petrol and diesel massively, massively, massively. Um, nice piece on Glasgow's history of livable neighborhoods there. And remember what I told you about the uh, blog post by Joe Dunkley on targets. That is a must read. Uh, Katrina Swanson on the do's and don'ts of tactical urbanism. Uh, still got this petition by mums uh, for lungs uh, against Freight Transport Association, now Logistics UK, lobbying to delay clean air zones, ULESs, LESs, etc. John Burke's article. And uh, Paddle Me are offering uh, offers of cargo bike trading for businesses considering shifting from vans. Do send that out to everybody you know who's using vans. 
uh, got that webinar, Islington Active Travel on 24th. This is important from the government about switching to sustainable transport. A number of things talked about, like cutting parking, but in, in uh, so-called free parking in town centres, but they're not actually advocating the kind of radical stuff that I'd like to see and many of us would like to see, but you must read that. It's about what seems to have uh, got people into sustainable and active transport. Don't forget the LCC's piece on the uh, Broadgate ruling, uh, money from Foundation for Integrated Transport. And here's a nice little thing. Alexi Sale has got a series of YouTube videos. He's been off his bike for a five year layoff. Um, uh, I should say my paths have uh, crossed with Alexi Sale over the years. Uh, we both did teach training at the same time, uh, both lived in roughly the same areas in central London. Um, and it, he says an interesting thing in this video about how when he used to ride a bike, it was a really special, unusual thing. Uh, but now you're not special anymore as a cyclist in London. And that's very interesting. So do have a look at his lockdown bike rides. And here's the diversity page, nothing new on that, apart from an interesting discussion on Twitter with Sarah about fat shaming, in which she pointed out that, you know, don't just talk about being active as something for losing weight, um, which is something is actually talked about also in Peter Walker's book on the advantages of physical activity as part of your everyday um, uh, routine and she's got a nice graphic which she did there your body can take you wherever you want to go regardless of its size I thought that was quite nice um, so the delay slide is now the what's happening slide and it's still saying the same stuff as last week no further forward on active travel England or when part six road traffic act 2004 comes in. I know it's a bit boring, but I'm going to keep on doing it until those things have actually happened. In the UK, Stockport, this is the Hedons. This is before, note the barrier there, and after. And that's been bollarded. A bit of discussion about this. Uh, apparently, the tactile is in the wrong place. Uh, I personally, it would be a bit nicer to have wider green space, but it does actually serve a, dra a drainage function. And uh, some people pointed out there should be reflectives on the bollards, but it's uh, you know obviously a step forward. Meanwhile, Gloucestershire in Cheltenham uh, is still uh, pretty hopeless. Uh, plans re released for what Gloucestershire County Council claim is cutting edge cycling routes uh, costs the majority of the active transport budget for the whole year and fails LTN 120 on almost every sheet. So that's the bit of bad news for you. Another bit of bad news from Bolton. This is Crompton Way. These have just got in as if LTN 120 had never existed. Big central hatching, cycle lane, outside the cars, no protection uh, in terms of anything physical. Uh, so that's not nice, Bolton. Uh, okay, another bit of uh, official data released. Carbon dioxide emissions from road transport have risen 2% since 1990, and this doesn't include emissions due to road building or vehicle production. Important stats, thank you, Transport Action Network. In Leeds, a nice little video about improving Skelton Grange Bridge so that people can get onto a quite nice off-road route. Uh, so do have a look at that video. It shows a lot, of, um, a lot of diversity in the people who want to use that route. Now to London, uh, we're still the whole thing about the judgment about Bishopsgate and street space. Uh, still got to be aware of that and uh, pending appeal from TfL. 
Uh, what's new is there's been a cross-party letter to government signed by all the group leaders on the London Assembly, which is very rare, saying London should retain the 500 million pounds paid by Londoners in vehicle excise duty every year. Um, I personally am against vehicle excise duty being hypothecated because it feeds into this I pay a tax uh, mythology uh, that makes motorists feel that they have some special right to be on the road and that they've paid for it, which they haven't. Right, big news from Sutton. Uh, Sutton recommends removal of all streets-based projects. Uh, after further discussion, Sutton Council will be recommending this Thursday that all schemes are removed. We are angry and hugely disappointed, but we have no choice given the legal judgment. Legal judgment being the one on Bishopsgate. But Rafe Smith, a lawyer, says, incredible how many fibs are being told by Sutton the Liberal Democrats to try to justify ripping out schools, streets, LTNs and cycleways. In short, far from being legally compelled to do so, the decision tomorrow, if approved, is likely to be illegal. Um, so and he then gives uh, something, a, a report from lawyers saying the current schemes that are in, in Sutton, remain lawful. So it does look like it's not a legal decision, which Sutton have made, but a political one. And uh, they are the only borough who've done that. The only borough that's taken out LT all LTNs is Wandsworth. That's in London. Haringey has come up with some plans. Uh, this is something I took from an unnamed local activist. So most of the policies and plans feature no actual targets or timeframes. Uh, anything that isn't handed down by TfL uh, looks like they're going through the motions. National Cycle Network is used as part of the Cycle Lane Network. There's more on cycle training and parking than one Cycle Lane Network. And uh, appear to be worries about losing parking revenue as a reason to not support cycling. It's more complicated than that, and Haringey are spending a lot of their own money. But uh, when you actually look at the detail, it's apparently, according to the local activists, not that impressive. Southwark, here's Bermondsey Street. It's quite a nice little treatment there. Hackney, very important. Round one to Hackney Council, anti-LTN legal challenge dismissed at the High Court. Basically, the group that uh, opposed uh, Hackney LTNs lost the application to seek judicial review because it was after six weeks since the experimental traffic order was made. So they lost. Now, it might not happen again. Uh, they may be more... Um, uh, if there are future ETOs uh, or other orders, uh, they may be able to get their objections in swiftly. Nice little quote from John Burke. Where were the legal challenges when kids were being poisoned in their schoolyards? Uh, also a bit of investigation today showing the group involved is based in, guess what, a low traffic neighborhood in Romford. Yes, not in the borough. Hammersmith Bridge, a nice big article on problems to do with bridges in London. Uh, seems to be a plan to have a sort of double decker bridge with cyclists and pedestrians going in under cars, which I don't think is very nice, but anyway, read the article. Uh, Camden, last week I showed you some blue surfacing. I've been informed that uh, the blue surfacing which is, of course, part of a uh, separated cycle lane, will actually go across the whole junction, just to get that clear. And Hackney, here's some nice photographs when it was very cold by Chris Kenyon um, of ordinary everyday people. Here's quite a lot of them uh, benefiting from the street space program and from existing infrastructure. Uh, incidentally, I do have a bit of a thing about people sitting too low. I know a lot of newbies do want to sit low because they want to be able to put their feet on the uh, ground easily, but I think it would help if they got a nice, friendly, positive cycle training instructor to assist them with getting more of out of their cycling. Uh, 
Yeah, I picked that up today. You're replying to the cyclist dismount signs. Uh, this looks nice. Remember Alan Lang, who was secretary of uh, the CTC, saying, why don't we say drivers, please get out and push. Uh, that's not actually a real sign that was photoshopped, but, um, you know, nice idea. Um, this was sent to me about bloody EVs. Uh, these are the Teslas. Um, today, ordinary people can buy racing cars for the public road, but uh, don't worry about that. They're electric, so it's okay. They do something like 0 to 60 in two seconds, which is absolutely grotesque. And we've had a bit of a discussion uh, about that with Rod King on Twitter. Um, I spotted this in my street today, this vehicle. It is called a Barbarian. My thoughts exactly. And uh, there's a guy called Will Cycle on Twitter who has uh, some interesting t-shirts. He's giving the proceeds to a charity he does. So uh, I thought that would be, uh, you know, go to that website and there are lots of interesting designs, t-shirts and mugs and uh, whatnot. So that is it. Thank you. Any questions, anybody? Yeah, points of order as well. It's any of them. All good. Look like you're impeccable then, Bob. So we'll move on because we've got a jam-packed uh, schedule tonight. Uh, Thank you very much, Beeps. Sally, are you there for your... Hi. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, All yours. Um, I'm going to just give you an update on on what's going on in the northeast because there's a couple of things, a few things this week. Um, right. Okay. All right, can you see that? Yeah. Yep. You're all good. Um, yeah, so our, we, we, one of the uh, emergency active travel measures in Newcastle was to filter five small bridges that go over either metro lines or, um, or, or rivers. And that first six months of that, um, that, of that the, the kind of experimental order finished yesterday. So that's the consultation period finished. We had a whacking 20,263 comments on those five small bridges. Um, and the intention uh, the council have told us is that it's an 18 month order and they will leave it in, they will evaluate, but they don't have any in, in plans to take them out anytime soon. Um, but actually you can see the, the, the bridges there that were closed, but they have actually created three new low traffic neighborhoods which just because of where they're positioned. So the five black spots are the bridges, the three orange triangles are the new low traffic neighborhoods, but because they are also join on to um, areas which are already filtered, the actual area is, is more like this. And this is Newcastle boundary here. So one of the orange goes right up to the boundary. Um, so they're quite substantial. They kind of cover quite substantial areas now. So we're really hoping that they stay in. Um, we've had all of the same backlash. Um, I think that everyone else, some of the, the comments on Commonplace are eye-watering to say the least. Um, and a bit of bad press, a bit of good press, um, but we're, we're kind of pretty confident that councillors want to kind of properly evaluate, you know, you know, all the feedback they've had and the monitoring they've done. So we're not really too worried about them disappearing anytime soon. Uh, we've also this week, North Tyneside has announced that it's going to implement three, uh, four uh, school streets and after one, two after half term. And then I think two after possibly when the schools go back full time. One is a first school, two are primaries and one's a middle school. And I think the fact that there is one, a middle school schools included is is quite significant for us because that takes children well up into their teens I think that's I think it's the end of year nine that goes up to beginning of year nine so you're talking about getting into sort of 13 or so 14 um which you know usually school streets are for primary schools we haven't seen anything I don't think for secondary schools yet they're going to be uh, implemented with temporary barriers and volunteers to start with. And again, these are an 18 month experimental order. And at the end of that, they're hoping to make them permanent. 
And then the only other thing I was going to add is that uh, people might have seen this already. Carlton Reed had a go of one of the new e-scooters which have been launched in Newcastle today. Uh, my daughter and I also rode up, uh, cycled up Dean Street, which which he tries to go up on the e-scooter, and we saw three young men flying down at great speed. So um, all of the people that we've seen so far using them have been young men in Newcastle and they do seem to be enjoying them. Whether they'll uh, really be used for, I think it's key workers, they're sort of hoping will we'll use them uh, remains to be seen, but you can watch that video if you want to see more. And that's all I have. That's magic. Thanks, Sally. Um, yeah, so we've got um, three um, speakers tonight. I'm hoping they're all going to take about 20 minutes each. <laughs> we'll be here all night. But uh, it's fantastic. I'll, I'll bring in our Joyrider speaker. I think, is it Vive? Is that how you say that name? I do apologise. Are you here? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Sorry, it's short for Genevieve. Genevieve. Uh, well, well, welcome. Yeah, yeah, the floor is yours. Cool. I doubt that I'll take 20 minutes. Take as long as you like, it's all good. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably, um, what time is it? It's 36, okay. Uh, I'll probably take a few minutes and then people can ask me questions, which is usually the best way. Right. Uh, I haven't prepared a, a presentation, you're just going to have to listen to me. <laughs> that works. So, as, as many of you probably already know, just over 70% of all people who regularly ride a bike in the UK and men. Basically, joyriders are here to change the cycling equation. That's, that's really our objective. Uh, in 2019, men of all ages made three times as many journeys by bicycle as women. So that's a massive number, more journeys by bike. So 75% of the 1,400 women who participated in joyriders rides in 2018-19 had never ridden a bicycle before. And they're our target. We're not, we're not a club. We're not here to try and provide rides for women who already ride bikes. We're really here to provide rides for women who do not already ride bikes. That's what we're after and to give them a progression. When we asked our participants what had prevented them from riding before they came on a joyriders ride, 49% said the roads are too dangerous and I'm not confident enough. Before riding with joyriders, 26% said they could ride a bike but couldn't control it completely. And another 34% said they could ride a bike but would never ride on a road. So after joining joyriders rides, 70% ride confidently on the road and 36% describe themselves as confident riders in any traffic conditions. So we're, we're really trying to bring not just tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands more women to riding a bike and change that 2% of, of modal share in Britain to you know, something approaching, you know, hopefully maybe, maybe Denmark at around 16% would be lovely. You know, Netherlands at 27, that's a long way to go. But it's, um, I think a big part of what we're offering is for women to see cycling as a transport choice. It's not a sport. It's, it could be a Sunday afternoon poodle for a picnic. It could be the school run. It could be commuting. It could be going to the shops. Because women don't see it that way. In fact, a lot of people in this country see cycling primarily as a sport. And that's absolutely not what we're trying to get people to do. 30% um, of all women who don't ride a bike say they would like to. And a lot of them come from minority communities. We've got a strong track record of reaching out to minority communities and getting those women on bikes. Wearing a hijab, wearing an abaya, that is not, that can, does not prevent women from riding a bike. You can wear anything you like on a bike. As long as the bike is set up and you take some precautions, depending on the type of bike you're on, you can ride it. It's just not an argument 
that you have to wear particular types of clothes because sometimes women go, well, I can't ride a bike because I haven't got the right gear. Okay. So all of these reasons that are given out for women not riding can be debunked. But this is the perception that loads and loads and loads of women have. It's not for them. That's what they think. And that's really what we're trying to do is change, change their mind. Our principals are all qualified cycling instructors. So we have a, a pathway and a lot of our volunteers are cycling instructors as well. We have a pathway through from learning to ride a bike into beginner rides uh, so that there's an immediate opportunity for women to start riding uh, and gain confidence in riding. And, and really what we're trying to do is, is not build a club, not have regular riders who always come on the same sort of ride week after week after week. What we're trying to do is offer a rite of passage so that the women who come for a beginner ride in a few months' time, six months from now, will be doing intermediate rides. A year from now might be commuting to work, but they won't be coming on joyriders rides anymore. Different women will be coming on joyriders rides and passing through a process. And some of those women will become ride leaders with us. We've definitely had women who started not being able to ride at all who've become cycling instructors. Yeah, but that's what we're after is it's a rite of passage. Okay, nothing more. Um, so we're just beginning to offer commuter rides, but we offer beginner, intermediate, commuter, and we're, that's really where we're aiming. During the pandemic, our audience reach massively expanded. We've got uh, almost 70 videos of routes and how-tos and all sorts of stuff up on YouTube that have been very heavily watched. Uh, and as a result of that, we've had women from around the country asking us when we're going to start offering joyriders rides outside of East London. Uh, so the good news is that um, we're well advanced with, with that process. Uh, we've got funding to run rides. We're going to be running in uh, right across London, Oxford and Manchester. Hopefully, well, starting once, once lockdown eases, uh, we expect the rule of six to return at some point. Uh, and right at this moment in time, we're recruiting and training ride leaders to be ready uh, to serve that, that need. Uh, so, you know, I didn't want to go on and on and on and on, so I'm not going to. Uh, that's what joyriders do. That's what we're about. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's doing something with the infrastructure <laughs> as, opposed to, as opposed to campaigning to have infrastructure. So uh, over to you for any questions. Yeah, thanks. That's great. And more power you for you to do that. It's a fantastic thing. Has anybody got any questions, comments? Sarah? Um, me, Sarah. Oh yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, any, um, um, yeah, so really great, um, Viv. Um, I've actually uh, just joined British Cycling's Diversity and Inclusion Panel, which you mentioned last week. And um, my experience is I've worked with quite a lot of women's community groups over the last uh, however many years. And also I mentor a British Indian ride leader. So um, I have a lot of these conversations about infrastructure and it's one of the reasons why I love attending this group as well. Um, so I love working with, uh, you know, and, and sort of mentoring people. And also I've seen your um, event, your, your comms, uh, Viv. So I'm, I'm sh sharing that and I really uh, love your idea of pathways as well. So I'm um, really interested in your, uh, if you could talk a little bit more about uh, your reaching out into different communities. Because I also um, have that feeling, you know, as soon as I mention um, Tameside Community Cycling Group, which is a BAME cycling group for women in GM, uh, people get really excited in the BAME community. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about your successes there. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we were fortunate in the sense that the founder of Joyriders um, and a number of the women who initially uh, would, were ride leaders with Joyriders uh, were uh, Asian, Asian women. And so 
we had an immediate uh, opportunity to reach out um, via faith communities predominantly, but also via schools um, has been a really big one. Um, you know, school mums, that sort of thing. Uh, and then some particular women's groups uh, within mosques and community groups. And, and we go out to them, basically. And, and what we find is there's a real... Um, it's, it's almost black and white in, in some ways. There's, there's a bunch of women who go, oh, I'd love to ride a bike. Oh, but I'm not sure I can, but I'd love to do it. And then there's another bunch who are sort of going, oh, no, 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 <laughs> not for me. You know, and obviously you're focusing on the bunch who are going, yes, I'd love to do it and uh, so on and so forth. And, and really it's providing, it's, it's finding those women, making them champions in a sense, doing case studies of them. And we've got lots of case studies which have been fantastic. Um, and really, you know, find always amongst our most popular things that, that we run on social media or whenever we tell a story, it really gets huge uptake. Um, and, and I think the great thing is that women see people like them riding a bike. Um, you know, one of my favourite stories is, is being on, a, on one of our rides probably 18 months ago and we're riding down, the, down a road a busy road, and there was a uh, an Asian woman at the bus stop with a, her daughter who was probably four or five, and the daughter looked at us and tugged on her mum's dress. Mum, look at them. That's a, I want to do that. You know, it was just really amazing. You know, and and that's the thing is is when people see people like them doing it, they believe they can, and I think that's a huge. Hugely important. Uh, David, did you have a question? Yeah, just quickly, do you provide access to free bikes? Because that's been very important in Birmingham. Yeah, that is really important. Um, we It depends on the borough that we're in. Um, here in Waltham Forest, where, where we started, uh, Waltham Forest have a large number of, of uh, free bikes that are available both for uh, training and for, um, for rides. Uh, and they also have a sort of bike hire scheme where people can get a bike out for uh, four weeks at a time, um, which is often a great, a great thing in terms of people moving into the position where they're thinking, I think I might buy a bike type of thing. Uh, and certainly when we talk to um, boroughs and local authorities, that sort of thing, we, we do stress the need for the provision of bikes. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Steve? Uh, yeah, I just put the post up, uh, uh, banging on about uh, how brilliant Copenhagen is. Uh, I gave a paper at Alberg University and I had a good walk around. And I'm just so amazed at how many uh, young ladies, you know, women in general, were flying around on the bikes and how confident they were. You know, they must learn from a very early age. And uh, they all seem to have the sort of more relaxed sort of Dutch bikes. But again, the segregated cycleways, so they're, they're very, you know, safe. You know, it, um, but, but it got me thinking, you know, they must have learned from a very early age. You know, I, I have a son and daughter and my son could ride a bike from three, just picked it up and rode it, no stabilizers. And my daughter as well, um, she needed a stabilizer for quite some time, but we eventually got her to ride. But I think uh, it, it's sort of more nurture. We, we need to encourage more parents to, help uh, you know young ladies with uh, you know girly uh, balance bikes and the upwards you know it starts at a very early age you know getting uh, women into cycling uh, my own daughter is teaching her daughter now my granddaughter how to ride a bike on a balance bike so you know it's stuck in there but uh, I really did love the presentation there thank you you're welcome is there, is there any comment you want to give on on younger women and and, uh... Yeah, I think I think that uh, my observation as a cycling instructor would be that uh, that is also very uh, stratified in terms of community. Um, I see a lot of young white women bringing their white kids, boys and girls, to learn to ride, but I don't see as many black or Asian people bringing their kids to learn to ride because it's not considered to be something that you do. Whereas I think in, um, broadly speaking, 
in white communities, it is considered to be something that is, is normal. You know, it's just a thing that yeah, you get to a certain age and you learn to ride a bike. That's what happens. Um, and, and then the big challenge is keeping girls riding when they get into their teens because they get a lot of peer pressure. You know, oh, it's very sweaty and it's this and it's that and it's all sorts, you know, which, of course, all depends about how, how fast you're going, what you're wearing, all that sort of thing, but they don't see it that way. You know, so there's a real, um, that socialisation of, of girls at that early teen age of wanting to fit in and being like everybody else and wearing makeup and doing this, that and the other, you know, isn't necessarily seen as compatible with riding a bike. You know, therefore they stop and they don't come back for a long time. You know, there's certainly some that keep going, but you, you get a big drop off, I think, uh, at that age. So you, you've got, yeah, some, I think uh, Steve's right, there's some big hurdles to overcome uh, in terms of reaching out to uh, communities, but also keeping girls riding once they get to a certain age. That's brilliant. Um, well, thanks for that talk. We'll move on to the next one. Hopefully, we'll have a bit of time for discussion at the end. Sarah Berry, I know you're there because I can see your chat, but are you ready? talk to us i am ready sorry just like constantly chatting um i definitely won't take 20 minutes so that will be good um can everyone see my screen okay yeah it's loading up fantastic uh, you're seeing the exact same thing i am yeah, um hi everyone um big fan of ideas with beers i only worked up the courage to join for the first time last week um so this is my second week here um very excited to be here and going to chat to you today a little bit about um my approach to low traffic neighborhood marketing um to put it in a very serious context and to put it in a less serious context how i learned to stop worrying about the aunties and love my ltn um so from the very get-go um i've had a sort of three pronged strategy um for work on ltn so um in in, in to put it very in a very short way um a year ago i didn't own a bike and i'd never ridden a bike in london um i was not at all involved in this community and then i live in lambeth and the railton low traffic neighborhood went in and it inspired me to go and ride, buy a bike um, and then I learned how to ride my bike with confidence and then I became obsessed with low traffic neighborhoods because I saw sort of firsthand how transformational they'd been for me in my life um, and I thought that they were really effective and wanted to make sure that they were you know given given fair dues and installed as effectively as possible wherever else they could go um, and this has sort of been my strategy from the get-go. So at the outset, that looks like working on the sort of Railton low traffic neighborhood Twitter account. Um, I also worked on the Lambeth Living Streets Twitter account and then some stuff offline as well. Um, I'm gonna talk through very quickly the sort of three philosophies that underpin that strategy and show examples, some of which are from me, some of which from other folk. Um, I don't want people to think I'm taking claim for, for all of the stuff in here because I, I just think it's a good example. Um, so first things first, showing love and support. So um, I don't know about your experience of the world and especially the internet, but mine is that people love talking about things that they hate and very rarely talk about things that they like. Um, so one of the first sort of approaches to low traffic neighborhoods, particularly in Railton, which is where I kicked off, was to create a culture where people felt like they had permission to love it and to talk about how they loved it and to talk about how they supported it. Um, on the left hand side you'll see a see a picture there that that was what sort of kicked off all of my campaigning on on low traffic neighborhoods to be completely honest with you we um, I designed this sort of poster that um, parents could download for their kids to color in during the first lockdown um, to give them something to do for half an hour while they were desperate to find some sort of activity um, and display in their windows um, you'll you'll see here this was this was within I think two weeks of us getting our low traffic neighborhood letter so the planters were still all going in people knew what it was in theory but didn't know what it was in practice and we definitely didn't have any sort of opposition brewing yet um, that was that was still on the horizon and what it meant was we sort of formed this culture around loving the LTN before any opposition started and still if you walk down some of the streets in in sort of Railton LTN every second window will have these posters there um 
and there were variants of those made so you'll see the one next to that the we love rltn graphic um, that was never meant as a poster but i still sort of walk around the area and occasionally see it in people's windows with no idea as to how it got there um, we just sort of created this culture of this being a thing that was okay to like um, and sharing stories of people's positivity, particularly if those things were shared in private forums. So um, you'll sort of see a WhatsApp message there that was someone saying that they had a conversation with their delivery driver who was saying um, that he loves, loves the LTN because there's no traffic on it and they can do all of their deliveries really easily. Um, and there's, there's sort of no, no congestion holding them back. Um, that sort of thing, I found that, again, people were, you know, very eager to share positive stories in the privacy of a WhatsApp group that we could then amplify, obviously keeping it anonymous so that people couldn't be identified. Um, but then I think when you see, you know, at that point that we posted that, I think Relton LTN had like 200 followers, but we still managed to get quite good engagement on that. It sort of made people think that if they shared their positive stories, they would get that kind of encouragement as well. Um, and you'll see on the right hand side, um, this was this was something that was that was more popular in the community than I thought it would be though if I had my time again I target an older age group. Um, we ran a competition in a local nursery for um, kids to decorate a sign saying leave your car at home and explore our low traffic neighborhood. Um, what I learned is that four and five year olds cannot draw they're not artistically talented people, um, though they have a lot of enthusiasm which is nice. Um, so we ended up I think with like two usable outcomes from these kids which were basically two children that had the same idea which was to ride their bikes through paint and then ride them over the poster. Um, so basically the winning designs were ones that weren't brown and all over the all over the letters. Um, but these went up in the community in the around the LTN. It says painted by Ivy age five. So when Ivy's walking or cycling or, or doing whatever she does to get to nursery, she can see her sign up in the community. You know, we created very early on this sort of feeling that it was that it was OK to love LTNs um, and that that was something that was all right for you to do. And I noticed a real difference in Railton and Lambeth in terms of how people vocalize their support and other boroughs around London and other cities around the country with when sort of opponents got on the front foot and then people were nervous about showing their support because they didn't want to piss off their neighbors. Sort of like we got in before that was even the case. The second thing is sharing interesting information. Um, I'm a big fan of Lambeth Council. Sometimes I feel like I'm the only person who's a big fan of Lambeth Council. Um, that's because this, this project is the only thing I've ever engaged with them on. So they've been doing great in my eyes, um, but they haven't been particularly good at sharing information. Um, so when we got the letter about the low traffic neighborhood, it didn't actually even explain what a low traffic neighborhood was. It just said that a bunch of roads were closed and you were gonna get fined if you drove on them. Um, so we sort of, sort of saw a big part of this is stepping in to fill that information space. Um, so a lot of the past year of mine has been reading reports and research documents and academic articles on, um, you know, what, what the benefits of low traffic neighborhoods, the benefits of cycle schemes, what the pedestrian pound means, Donald Appleyard's research, and trying to make that accessible and entertaining to a 10 year old. Um, and, and put that out into the world with sort of a something that it doesn't take any brain power to sort of consume and making sure that that information is there. But that is extended to also things like the equalities impact assessment of the local LTN um, and traffic counts and different things like that, trying to put that information out there, make it entertaining and make it accessible so that someone who's coming across it for the first time ever um, can find it. I think that's this is the least exciting aspect of the strategy, but one that is one that is useful because not because it changes anyone's mind, I don't think, but it arms other people who might be advocates or might be supporters with the information that they need to feel confident having conversations with their friends, family, neighbors about low traffic neighborhood schemes. And the last one is to use them. And this is the one that I think I spend when I when I talk to groups around the country um, that I spend the most amount of time talking about because it's the one that people forget. The absolute best tool in our arsenal for talking about how good LTNs are is to ignore what all of the opponents are saying, pretend that they don't exist and just actually use them and let them transform our communities the way that they can. Um, so you'll see here we've got a top left, we've got a photo of a little boy pretty sure he's four years old, but I'm terrible at aging anyone, but especially children. Um, but this was his first time ever riding his bike on the road. 
and this was in the LTN and you can see the joy in his face at the idea of of using that you'll see beneath that I've got my diary of a new cyclist talking about how because of the LTN I'm learning how to ride a bike and how important that is and transformational that is for me you've got on the left hand side here again I had nothing to do with this but I think it's fab um, someone altered the the sign that Simon and Rob and I worked on for Halloween to say road open to bats and witches and pumpkins um, in all, all of these examples are from Lambeth, by the way, there's more around the country. Um, you'll see the parklet that Lambeth Council and a group of volunteers have, have joined together to build a conversation with this man who was sitting in it was saying he was so glad that that was there because before it had been really difficult for him to walk to the shops, even though the LTM was there because there was nowhere for him to take a break. So making sure that we utilize that now quiet street space to, to give him a break. Um, bottom right hand corner, that's me sitting in what is called Barnwell Gardens. Um, it came about because a local business who was a laundromat um, got really excited about the fact that their street corner was now a lot quieter because there wasn't any traffic and he thought maybe it could be used for something better than um, fly tipping, which is what it had been used for before. Um, so he sent a message to the, to the street WhatsApp group saying, would anyone be supportive of me making a little parklet bench garden space here? Um, another neighbour said, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a landscape architect and I'm on furlough. I'd be very happy to help you design that. Um, and then another local person said, well, I've got a whole bunch of woods that I'm not using, so I can donate that and I can help create that into this thing. And all of a sudden you've got now this mini parklet space from a group of people who, to be completely honest with you, weren't super fussed about the LTN, um, but love what that space has now enabled them to do. Um, and you'll see in the top right hand corner, perhaps my favorite, um, that's a partridge in a pear tree for anyone who can't identify it. One of the local LTNs around here did a 12 days of Christmas scavenger hunt through their LTN where they decorated each of the planters to align with um, a different line of that song with the five golden rings bit that everyone loves singing. Um, these things, you know, have for the most part, don't have a lot to do with active travel, which I think is the lens that we always come at low traffic neighborhoods from. But if you're someone who, you know, drives everywhere at the moment and doesn't see a problem with that, you're not gonna look at promises of active travel and feel like that's something that's gonna be given to you. But if you're told, you know, that there's gonna be more opportunities for children to play, there's gonna be more opportunities for elderly people to be able to sit and rest on their way to go to the supermarket. There's gonna be ways to counteract loneliness. There's gonna be ways to introduce nature to your area. Um, there's gonna be ways to have barbecues and street festivals and different things like that. All of a sudden, LTNs become something that's given to you rather than taken away. So. I think, you know, when you start adding these extra measures in, when you see communities who are taking these, taking these initiatives and running with them and, and building community around them, it becomes much, much harder to take them out. Um, and I think we'd all agree that if the scheme is designed well, as long as you leave it in for the entire consultation period and that period is long enough, you'll probably end up with a community that's broadly supportive of it. Um, and these sort of things make it a lot harder for it to be taken out prematurely. Um, yeah, and that's, that's basically it. That's, that's been my approach. Um, I'm always really excited to hear about what other communities are doing with this. Um, and basically excited to work with anyone on any LTN anywhere. Um, so thanks for, thanks for having me, Brian. Thanks, Sarah. That's brilliant. You've been a real inspiration to me and many others that have been following your diary and uh, that's what we do it all for. So uh, who's, anybody got any questions or comments for Sarah? Just some brilliant marketing tips, I thought. I don't see any hands up. Oh, David, go on. That's not a hand up, it's a clap, mate. Just a clap. Oh, God, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm getting too old. For hand that. up, hand up. I can't find the gadget thing. That's, my, that's more my level of technology. Ruth, please ask. Oh, Sarah, brilliant. Absolutely fab. Where are you? I can look at you. Fab. Um, I'm just curious to know how many, what the car ownership is in Lambeth and what the demography of age, just because obviously West London, we know car ownership is massive and the 40 to 60 year olds are the ones who are the most resistant to a lot of this stuff. So um, I know that Hackney is 29% car ownership, but I don't know what it is in Lambeth. Thank you. 
So Bryn's just, Bryn's just posted it in the chat. It's 66% or 60 without access to a car, um, which is, is really high and I acknowledge it's really high. Um, the other thing that we're dealing with in Lambeth that's complicated and I don't think we've done particularly well um, is that we've got a really large Afro-Caribbean community who have an entirely different cultural attachment to their cars. Um, and this is something I'm only just starting to sort of learn about. Um, and I think that I think that when you're dealing with communities that have either high car ownership or a real strong attachment to, to cars for whatever reason, it's even more important to focus on the sort of, you know, different benefits that come from reallocating street space so that it's not totally favoured in terms of in terms of cars. So, you know, if I was, I, I had a chat with a group of folk from Wimbledon, um, Yes, was it yesterday? I think it was yesterday. Um, and we were we were talking about the sort of ideas around that maybe the three key areas to focus on in Wimbledon would be independence when for older people um, who are no longer able to drive but really need to be able to to get around their neighbourhood by by walking or on east on sort of mobility aids um, with joy and freedom and ease. Um, talking about the sort of the sort of village connectivity so the idea of those community events that you can have that people might be um, sort of supportive of and then also around loneliness um, so I my, the organization that I worked for did a lot of work with Joe Cox before before she was murdered and one of her big focus areas was around loneliness in the UK and I think it's a bigger issue than um, we in the active travel community generally realize but this, we have a lot of overlap in terms of our ambitions and the ambitions of folks who are working on loneliness in terms of community cohesion and connectivity and Donald Apple's Yard's research and getting to know our neighbours. So I think um, it's one of those things about knowing knowing who your neighbours are and knowing who your community is and what they're interested in and, and talking about that. And unfortunately, for now, for a lot of folk, you know, that won't be walking and cycling as a means of transportation, um, you know, but it could be in time once they, it's like very difficult for people to visualize a world in which it's safe and enjoyable to do that if for a really long time they've lived in a world where it's not. But um, if I'm any example to go by as someone who was like, I will never cycle in London, um, when those changes happen, you know, you're capable of more than you, than you first imagine. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, David, do you want to come in? David Bamford. Hiya, Sarah. Um, yeah, thanks for everything. Been following your work for a while. I saw you did a thread the other day about um, body positivity, and I thought that tied into kind of the BAME stuff really interestingly. So is there kind of, before we get LTNs, is there anything we can do preemptively to reach out to the sort of groups we might naturally be alienating as kind of active travel campaigners, um, if that makes sense? Yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, and to be honest, like I was really blown away by, I think we're in a really good position would be, would be my summary. I was really blown away by the reaction that I got from the community around talking about body positivity and active travel. I saw a lot of, wow, I'd never thought about this before and I can see where I've been going wrong and I'm gonna do a lot. I'm gonna like focus on doing better going forward. Um, which just like filled me with optimism for the group of campaigners and advocates that we've got here because it are people that are that are not coming at this from a position of ego but coming from it from a position of curiosity. Um, I think that you know I'm I'm not an expert of of working with BAME communities and every you know BAME communities kind of lumps a lot of people together and there'll be different ones depending on where you are but I think going and having an open mind having these conversations approaching it from a position of curiosity and thinking about where things can overlap you know I, I had a conversation with um I mentioned this in a chat with Deneen Rowe for a new podcast that I've been doing and she was talking about the fact that you know for Afro-Caribbean communities the car is this massive status symbol of saying you know I might not have the same privilege as all the white communities around me but I'm able to access this thing which is a real indicator of success and I'm able to communicate um, to my family back home that I'm successful through this thing and also it keeps me somewhat shielded from police and, and other members of the sort of public that might be hostile to me is essentially something that parents teach their children um, which I'd never considered before but she was sort of like 
if my neighborhood can be consulted saying that there's going to be more opportunities for street barbecues for parties for for coming together as like a big community celebration um which is something that's also really valued there rather than you're going to be able to ride a bike or you're going to be able to go for a walk which is seen as something that's not accessible to that community the response might have been totally different um so i think we need to you know be reflective about what we do and don't know go and have conversations and like don't be instrumental in those conversations you know build relationships with those communities because you both want your community to be better and your neighborhood to be better um and then and then see what you see what you can learn so like you know in railton we talk about um my dream for railton road is to have a like big day where we set tables up along the whole length of railton road and have like all these games of dominoes happening um because one of the one of the criticisms that i got really early on from from members of of the sort of local community here was oh well when we used to sit out on the roads and play dominoes and listen to our music and drink you like sent us to jail and now you want to do it for your white middle class bullshit and it's just like well yes i want to do it for my white middle class bullshit but i also want to do it so we can play dominoes and drink and listen to music on the street because that sounds awesome um so thinking about you know going and having conversations and saying if there were no cars on this road what would you want to do and how can I support you in making that happen um I think is is a is a great start at least well time for one quick one and there's no way I'm not going to let Sally ask a question because uh I love Sally Sally come yeah. in um, yeah thanks I thought that was really great thank you Sarah and actually I just was going to sort of add that I think there is a difference between areas that have high and low car ownership but i definitely don't think it's impossible to put them in areas with high car ownership um but it's just time is the difference so we our three areas uh, i think car ownership is something like 77 78 percent have access to at least one car so it's really high um and and in fact there's a whole facebook group which is just devoted to traffic and and having rants about cyclists so um i would say that the main difference though was just that it takes longer so uh one area had um a, an ltn in place for other reasons there was temporary closure for a very long period of time and they reckoned that after six months people were starting to come around to the idea but that after a year and a half you know so it was that was the beginning of doing things as a community um and they've now you know done huge amounts and done you know lots of things that you mentioned lots of stuff in the streets and really great community building but they it did take a long time for that to get going um the area right where, that i'm in which has one now um or right next to me we couldn't have gone in near any of that it, we've been positive about it but but if you stick your head too far over the parapet it just made it worse so um and and it's quite you know people know their neighbors really well and so people didn't want to upset people but i, I think in time again here if, it, if you know in a year's time if they threaten to take it out i suspect things will have changed quite a lot so just for uh, for people who think oh i couldn't do that because i don't live in a area with low car ownership i think it's still really 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 good advice just might you might not want to do it right away tread carefully <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for that. Thanks. We might move on because I think that was more. I'm going to classify that as the comment. <laughs> um, but yeah, that over to Roxanne now is definitely an ideas with beers legend. And great to hear from you again. What's happening in Cambridge? What timing has she got? Thanks, Brian. Oh, when did I become an ideas with beers legend? I'll take it. Um, bear with me. I'm just getting some slides up, but um, I want to whip through this because I think it'll be more about questions than um, anyone actually wanting to see slides. Uh, using Cambridge, oh, I must mention, we have a petition that needs signing. So I'll get a link up at the end of my talk, but we are, um, Highways England has installed some, some barriers on our new cycling and walking bridges. And it seems to happen every January, we get new barriers at the start of the year. And the last ones, we had them ripped out within a month. So uh, let's see if we can get these ones taken out quickly too. Um, but they do like to test us. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm just having a technology moment. I'm going to remove your legendary status now. Take it away. I don't, this isn't, what is happening? My mouse is just completely- There are different forms of legend. <laughs> yeah, take take the status away. Fire me. 
Um, oh, it's just because PowerPoint wants to, you know, wreck everything. Um, so sorry. What I'm going to talk about, I shall start talking while I get this sorted. What I'm going to talk about is a question I get asked all the time. So I've decided I need to create a presentation, a set talk, um, so I can answer everybody's question. And that is, how do you go about hiring staff for your cycling campaign? So I'm going to tell you. Here we go. It's working now. Done. Okay. Um, right. So uh, Brian called this setting up a professional cycling campaign. So I'm going to go with Brian's um, topic as he put it on Twitter. Um, and I guess that does mean if you've got staff that you're professional, but the question might be to hire or not to hire. And if so, how to hire a staff member for your cycling campaign. Uh, and I just want to start with a disclaimer. This is just one example from my experience. This is not the def definitive what you should do. It's just to give you some prompts about what you should start thinking about and how you might want to start thinking about these things. For a bit of context, uh, I'm not just an Ideas with Beers legend. I'm also the executive director of CamCycle, Cambridge Cycling Campaign. Um, I've been in this role for six years and I was CamCycle's first employed staff member. Um, and I do believe I was the first local cycling campaign staff member outside of London, but I think there should be plenty more of me popping up. Um, and CamCycle now has three staff members and we might even be up to four by the end of this year. Watch this space. <laughs> okay, but what I want to say is before you even start thinking about staff members, start thinking about your theory of change. Now, this is just an example of a theory of change. This isn't the one you need to use. Um, but what you really need to think about is what impact are you trying to have? You must start with that. What kind of change are you trying to create? What outcomes need to happen to make that change, to have that impact? What outputs, what activities, and then for what inputs do you need? Now, really, you start with what impact, then you go back down to your inputs and work your way back up. And you've sort of got to go up and down your theory of change um, and tweak it. And eventually it all starts to add up. But think really your inputs would be, well, we've got volunteers, we've got some systems, we've got some mailing lists, we've got these kinds of skills. That means we can do these kinds of activities. These types of things might happen and we might get this impact. Or you might just realize that your inputs and your impacts just don't add up and something else needs to happen in the middle. And that might be where you need to look at getting a staff member with particular skills to help you. But we're going to keep coming back to theory of change because we need to keep checking in with this. And um, if it's a new concept to you, there's some really great resources out there. And I highly recommend doing a course in this. And there's some links at the end that will help you. Uh, CamCycle's also created a bit of a template that we, we use to try and guide us when we think of a campaigning idea, because it's really easy to just start campaigning and just start doing stuff without checking in with, is all this stuff we're doing actually going to get us the outcome that we want and the impact that we want? And often when you go back and, and map it out, you realize there's a different way, there's a different path that's easier. And there's just a couple of other switches or you can flick or a few other people to talk to that will get you your change. So it's why do the work, write it out, think of what impact you want to have and keep coming back to that as you maybe work through this process. Make sure you've also got a clear idea of what's your vision, what's your mission and what are your values. Uh, really, really important um, to have these. Cam Cycle, we, we've always had our mission of more, better and safer cycling for all ages and abilities. We've had a broad idea of a vision, but really locking that down and articulating that has been helpful. But the thing we didn't have were values and having values is amazing when it comes to helping you make decisions. And there's a lot of decisions to be made here. So I really recommend taking a look at your values and thinking about how you want to do your work, not just what work you want to do um, to put some work into that. And here's a bigger idea of our vision. And you're welcome to, to steal this and edit it and take it and do whatever you like if it's useful to you. But if you're going to start um, professionalizing your cycling campaign or your walking campaign or your active travel campaign, um, there are a number of different models um, that you may need to look at. And there are some really big questions that you need to start thinking about. Do you want to have a membership 
What liability are you willing to take on? Um, are you aspiring to employing anybody? Will you need to enter into any contracts? What kind of fundraising might you want to do? What kind of campaigning do you want to do? These questions will impact what kind of model you should look to being. Likewise, these questions should tie into your theory of change and that will influence what model you want to be. Other parts of your theory of change might impact what model you should choose. Broadly speaking, if you're going down the path of hiring someone, I would say you need to look at a charitable incorporated organization. Learn from CamCycle, we are not a charitable incorporated organization. This model didn't exist when we set ourselves up. So we are a charity um, and we are now undergoing the work of moving towards a charitable incorporated organization and it's, it's going to be massive. Um, and if you can, do that work earlier on and not have to go through the change process, you will be much better off. So really take a long term view about where are you trying to take your organization and what work should you put in now to prepare yourself. You could be a community interest company and that's probably going to have a lower governance workload, uh, less reporting requirements. Um, and maybe that's enough for where you're at at the moment. But if you then need to change to a CIO down the track, you're going to have to close your bank account, open a new bank account, transfer your assets. There's quite a bit of work there. So this is not a complete table. You need to do this work yourself for your organization and go and find this out. Understand what are the benefits of this model for you or the pros and cons of it? What are the requirements for you if you take this model? And what kind of governance requirements are there? So do you need to have uh, trustees? What kind of reporting will you need to do? What kind of accounts will you need to present? Uh, you, what will you be liable for? So at the moment, CamCycle as a charity, our trustees are ultimately liable for what we do. Their houses are on the line. That's quite scary for me as an employee. If I stuff up, the trustees might lose their houses. So <laughs> I'm really not comfortable with that. And, and it also means that, that it scares people off being a trustee, which is one of the reasons why we're looking towards being a CIO, because then it's a separate, le separate legal entity. Um, and, and we you know, don't have houses at risk if someone decides to sue us or we have an event and somebody something happens. Um, so these are the things to look at. Uh, you know, with a CIO, there are different versions you need to look at if you want to have membership. Um, and if you're entering into co employment and contracts, you need to make sure that you've, you've got a solid um, model. In particular, for fundraising, there is a lot of fundraising opportunities out there if you are some form of charitable organization. Again, that being a CIO or a registered charity, um, a lot of grant funders won't give you funding if you're not one of these models. So thinking about what funding you need influence what model. However, if you want to get really political, that's going to rule you out from, from being one of these models uh, because it, there, are, there are some rules about how involved you can get in, in political campaigning. So lots of questions there to look at and you should draw some kind of table like this and map it all out and, and see what is the best fit for you and your plans. Uh, and so then if you're looking at being bigger, having more impact, you probably need a bit more money to do that. Uh, and so you, you need to work on your fundraising strategy. Now, here is just, again, a really quick example where I've put a few points down. You need to do this work for your organization. And I recommend creating some kind of table like this and writing down every single potential channel for income, major donors, grants, crowdfunding, membership subscriptions, selling your furniture, donations, selling merchandise, um, you know, rattling a tin in the street I don't know think of every single way you think you could raise money and then think about what kind of potential you have there so for major donors do do you exist in a network where there are lots of people with lots of money major donors is possibly a really good channel for you do you have a lot of people who are involved in your campaigning who work in big corporates who might be able to go to the marketing department the HR department um, the the um, I don't know, the communications department, uh, and they might be able to, to provide some funding to support your organization. Do you want to have paid membership subscriptions? How many people follow you on Facebook? How many of those people do you think you could turn into members? How much money do you think they would be willing to pay for a membership? Add that all up and see what you think that bucket might be worth. Really you know, work out all of these channels, then find out what do you need to do to, to make that 
bucket happen so you if you want to do membership subscriptions could you survey your followers on facebook or on twitter and ask them you know, how much would you be willing to pay would you be willing to be a member um and then think about what kind of what requirements there are for you to enable that to happen so for example if you want to raise money through grants you will need to be one of those um, charitable organizations there are very few grant funds that will will pay you um, those funds if you want to use um, a great donation platform like the Big Give or Local Giving, you will need to be a charity. If you're going to go and get your own individual donations um, from something on your website, you're going to need some form of platform to let that money come through. Once you start having money coming through, you need to be doing a serious job with your accounts. Do you have someone who can do your accounts? Um, so you, you, you're probably going to need quite a few columns here as you work out, well, actually, what is it that I'm going to need? How many hours a month or a week of work would that be? Is that something that a volunteer will do? Or is that something where we need help from a staff member or some kind of outsourced model? So um, this is something that I've done with CamCycle. I do this every few months. I go back to this, look at each of these channels. Oh, what conversations am I having? Oh, what new research have I seen? Um, oh, this new thing's popped up. Should we give this a go? What, how much do we think we can get from this? We did this much last year. Can we get a bit more this year? Um, another thing to really point out is if you are a CIO, a charity, you are eligible for gift aid. So that could increase the donations that you get by 25%. That's a Huge amount. That's a, for cam cycle about eight and a half thousand pounds a year. So um, there's a, a lot of benefit to that. If you're looking at more trading, then you might need to have a trading subsidiary or a different model again. So look at that. Um, for, I really recommend taking a look at other organizations' financial reports and seeing how they do it. So this is Cam Cycles, and you can get this for free off our website. Um, and this is hot off the press. I, I, I wrote this just a month ago. Um, and so this is how we, we got all of our funding over the last financial year um, and you, how we went about it, basically. So feel free to go and take a look at that uh, and find other organizations that you think, oh, I think that, you know, they're operating in our area or they have a similar network. Let's go and see um, how they're doing this. Don't just look at cycling campaigns. Um, and you can get this off our website. So no need to read that. Um, I mentioned for fundraising, there are organizations like the Big Give and um, uh, we also use the co-op local community fund so just this christmas we raised fifteen thousand four hundred and ninety pounds plus a bit extra of gift aid through uh the big give that's the biggest year we've ever had i'm just going to tell you right now you're probably unless you're in a very highly populated area you're probably not going to achieve that in your first year um but again because we are a registered charity we were able to go and use the big give um, to raise that amount we were also eligible for the co-op local community fund um, and so far we're at 1400 um, pounds we should get seven or eight thousand pounds from that by the uh in the next six is it six or ten months i've not done a good job i personally have only contributed 15p i need to go buy some more chocolate from the co-op um but these are the kind of campaigns that our that so kind of fundraising channels that cycling campaigns can actually get funding from if you've got the right model and you're putting together your grant application. Quick one about membership, big question about to pay or not to pay. Again, think about the impact that you want to have. Go back to your theory of change. Who are the people that you need to influence with your work? And are they going to be more influenced by your paid subscriber numbers or by the general number of followers that you have on your social media go back and look at what you know, model you're using and how much um, resource that is taking from you in terms of paid membership subscriptions benefits you're going to have more income you're probably going to be taken more seriously by stakeholders uh, and you'll probably have more buy-in from those people who are members the downside is it is a lot of work you need someone who's going to manage that. You need systems. You're going to have admin. You've got finance. You've got reconciliations to do. Um, so there's quite a bit of work there. Um, if you have unpaid subscribers, you've got higher numbers. So that could look quite good. It's less workload for you. But are you going to be taken seriously? One of the things I love about CamCycle having membership is a number of local councillors a member of CamCycle. So when you go to a planning meeting and they have to do their disclaimers at the start of the meeting and four of them put their hands up because they're members of CamCycle, that says something. They don't have to say that if they follow us on Twitter. 
Uh, in another situation, we came head to head with another organization um, in a planning meeting and, and the counselor says, tell us about your membership, tell us about your model. And CampCycle, I was able to say, well, we're constituted, we have 1500 paid members, we communicate with them every week, this many people contributed to our work. And the other person was like, oh, it's me and 10 followers on Twitter. You're, we're clearly not equal and we can show that with evidence. You need a lot of stuff behind the scenes to help you do this. How are you communicating with your members? Uh, so we use Cyclescape as our platform, which I call sort of Cam Cycles Brain, where we put everything. We collaborate on documents using something. Again, Cyclescape was created by Cam Cycle. Ensembling was created by Cam Cycle. It's a document collaborating um, platform. We have Cameo, which is our membership organizer, where we can list all of our members. Uh, we use this to email them. We can, you can see on here, there's a map. I can actually say, show me all the people that live on this road or in this area and send them an email. Um, we use our print magazine and we have zero for accounts, Stripe for taking payments on our website. That's just a snapshot of the systems. So once you start working out your model and how it's going to look, you really need to map out those systems and how they will help you. The benefit, the great thing is you can have Cam Cycle, uh, Cyclescape for free. You could probably have Ensembling for free and Cameo. There are a number of other cycling campaigning organizations starting to use it now and it is very, very affordable. So if you want to talk to someone about those, let me know and I will introduce you. Once you've sort of sorted out all of that, you can now start thinking about whether to hire or not to hire. Uh, and it's really important that you map the skills of your organization because this will be really different for everyone. In Cambridge, we have a really, really high level of technical engineering technology knowledge. There was no need to hire someone with those skills. What was needed was somebody to herd those cats and, and channel their efforts in the right direction. Um, after that, we then realized that we didn't have a great strength in communications, so we hired a communications officer. But there are other campaigns where they're really great at campaigning, but maybe don't have someone who knows in detail what LTN 1 slash 20 means and when and how it should be applied. So, so map out your skills. What are you strong at and where are your gaps? But whatever you do, when you hire someone, your admin will be increased significantly. So really, it does just the sheer task of hiring someone and having enough money to come through to pay for that person means you're going to have a really, really high level of admin work. And I must make this point clear. Do not hire someone to reduce your workload as volunteers and leaders of your organization. It is not going to happen. Like <laughs> Hiring someone will increase your workload, especially in the beginning. If you're hiring someone, it's about the impact you want to have as an organization. Uh, let me say this again, it will not reduce your workload. <laughs> <laughs> um, at all uh, and I've just started a time this is just the beginning of a checklist if you're starting to hire someone things you need to think about the recruitment process that is going to take several hours a week from each person involved you've got to do interviewing who's going to manage this person who's going to write their job description how do you work out what to pay them you need to manage their performance what if they they do a bad job who's going to take that on board you need insurance you need to deal with payroll pensions policies procedures where are they going to work who's going to choose what laptop they get i i started day one in my job and and i'm I was just sitting in my house. I had no laptop. I had nothing. I had to start everything from scratch. So, so just you know, keep that in mind. What I can tell you though is CamCycle has been through this and we've worked out a lot of these things and anything I can share with you, I will share with you for free. I will give it to you. Um, policies, job descriptions, um, all sorts of things are there for the taking. So where do you go for some information? You should have a local council for voluntary services. They were so helpful for me when um, I started. So I really recommend getting in touch with them. The Small Charities Coalition is amazing and you can join them now as in, in any kind of structure that you are, I believe. And they do lots of training courses for free or very, 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 very cheap. Um, and I highly recommend that. The National Council for Voluntary Organizations is incredible. And the Charity Commission website has actually a lot of great information about what charitable model to choose um, and what you need to do. Cam Cycle, some just quick spots you can go to take a look. We've got our charity policies website. So that's got our donation acceptance policy, our salary benchmarking policy, our safeguarding policy, equalities, et cetera. You can have it and copy it, take it. Um, 
we our annual report i highly recommend having a look at that and our latest accounts are incredibly detailed so very helpful and just more broadly our cycling policies are on our policy web page i have no idea how long i spoke for probably too long i'm sorry <laughs> done <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we totally run out of time, but I think we can all agree that you've won back your legendary status. That was a, a fantastic talk, and I'm sure a lot of people learned a lot from that. But like, yeah, so if you want to, we won't do any questions now, I think, because we run over. Um, but like, yeah, you're always welcome back. I'd have you on every week if I could. Um, I'm just going to go to to Roof now for the last word. Let's try and make it a last. It'll be a last word, promise. Uh, I need to share screen, please. Do I just tap on it? Yeah, just go for it, Ruth. Okay. Go oh, on. I'm so bad at this. Sorry, folks. I had to set it up. Um, there we go. Can you all see this? Yeah. So really sorry to bring you all down. Fabulous talks. Fantastic women. You know, that's it. We should be running the world. But gorgeous photo on the left here of two little children hand in hand. Absolutely super. From Modacity, who some of you know from um, Delft, to from Vancouver, who and Absolutely gorgeous. Put it on a friend's website, just as something nice with no comment. What a pile of steaming excrement. What about pedestrians? What about PPE for the kids? They have no helmets or, oh, irresponsible, reckless, and not in control of cycles. Are you advocating one-handed cycling? Well, if Sarah's still here with a cup of coffee, of course you can do that with a Dutch-style bike. I did it all my life. Anyway, so sorry to bring it all down because it's been the most fab session. Just thought I'd share that lovely picture of the children, though, because that's what we're all working for. <laughs>